It's time to discuss imposing your will. What does it mean to impose your will in an MMA fight? Well, I'm going to show you guys the greatest moments of imposing one's will that I've seen in MMA, or at least the recent ones that I've seen. Okay, and, and what does it mean to impose your will? It basically means you want to drag your opponent into your style of fight. It doesn't always have to be you moving forward. It doesn't always have to be you striking and beating them up. It just means bringing your opponent into your realm and doing it effectively, basically engulfing them with your style, not playing their game in any way, shape, or form, okay? And I'm gonna show you guys some of my favorite moments when a fighter imposed their will. Let's get into this. One of the most recent examples Probably one of my favorites, Yuri Prohaska imposing his will on Alexander Rakic. First round, let's be honest, Yuri Prohaska got his ass whooped and he looked horrible in this first round. Some of the worst, flimsiest, weakest kicks I've ever seen from a heavier weight class fighter. Yuri Prohaska looked very awkward, a bit of an oddball approach. He looked a little bit like a dodo bird sort of taking a Nico Price approach, throwing everything 30 miles per hour as opposed to, you know, the usual 90 miles per hour fastball. You see everyone throws strikes at the highest level. Yuri Prohaska was getting his fucking ass beat. But, you know, Yuri Prohaska, Guerrero spirit, the warrior spirit, Yuri's got that holy martial arts ghost that kind of wills him to victory no matter what sometimes, right? His head can fall off, his arm can fall off the bone, and Yuri Prohaska still manages to get his hand raised. And in this fight, again, getting his ass whooped, getting lit up on the feet, taking horrible, horrific calf kicks, um, again, throwing weird strikes that's pissing off the fans that are rooting for him at home, or throwing a little flimsy calf kick and a little flimsy body kick with nothing on him. His punches had nothing on him. He's he's not even punching through. He's not even actually, like, freaking flowing through his punches. Your brass is flicking his hands up like a fool, like an absolute fool. And he's taking big one-twos on the chin, and you can see your Braska. You can even hear the commentators talk about it. They're saying, Yuri Braska has a, Joe Rogan that is, he says, dude, you guys notice Yuri? This man has a look of disdain on his face. He almost looks like he's disgusted by Alexander Rakic because Rakic had been talking some big talk. Rakic had been talking some shit and Alexander Rakic and Rakic was saying, dude, this guy's a fake samurai. He's always talking about samurai this, samurai that. He's not a real samurai. He just read a book and he was a hooligan back in the day and all of a sudden that's his new identity. But Yuri, of course, kind of proved otherwise because he's looking at Rakic and Yuri Prohaska's beating his chest and he's taking all the shots on the chin and he's just staring him down staring him deep into his soul and you can see Rakic just how you could start to see him sort of slow down and he's probably thinking dude what is it going to take for this guy to go down apparently he couldn't figure it out because in the second round Yuri Prohaska actually starts flowing through his punches like actually sitting on them a little bit and Yuri Prohaska is extending on his punches a little bit putting that extra bit of pop on them and then he rocks Rakic and it's just a snowball effect once Yuri has you rocked with something and he's starting to heat up and you haven't put him away and his opponent is starting to fade and they don't have the same sting on their shots you basically you know you may as well wrap it up because Yuri Prohaska at that point had just been uh he basically mentally broke Rakic in the second round rocked him um, Rakic tried his best to survive. He's crumpling into the canvas, and Yuri Braska is just finishing him off with elbows, vicious ground and pound shots. A total 180 from what he was doing in the first round, where, uh, you know, Yuri Braska might be a bit of a slow starter now that I think about it, because he does tend to have very flimsy, slow looking strikes early on in his fights. But once you get to the second round, I believe that's usually Yuri Braska's best round where he's most dangerous and uh again just marching forward towards alexander rakic just staring him down trying to break the man soul to soul kind of just took his soul in that fight so really good performance from yuri praska and just imposed his will the whole time even when he was getting his ass kicked he was imposing his will fifth round adesanya versus alex Pereira, their first fight at madison square garden alex Pereira earns the respect of a guerrero he goes Gehero mode, walks down Adesanya in the fifth, down three rounds to one. So he absolutely needed this round. If he didn't win this round by a KO or with a 10-8, he would have lost the fight. And his career is totally different in the UFC. He probably doesn't even get the rematch with Adesanya. 
probably doesn't even move up right away. And if he does, who knows how long it would have taken for him to even get a title shot up there. He needed this. Again, down three rounds, three rounds to one. Alex Pereira doesn't know how to take a back step in this fifth, right? And Adesanya starts the round sort of how he did against Kelvin Gastelum doing the whole I'm prepared to die, a botched. And he's in there and he thinks it's a big anime moment. And Alex Pereira shows, wait, no, no, wait a second. This is a ghetto moment. He walks him down, checks Adesanya's first kick as he falls over himself. And Alex Pereira just beats him to a pulp, beats him to a crisp up against the octagon, just hammering Adesanya with straight punches jabs right hands eventually getting him to circle into the left hook again it's not only that he's walking him down but he's throwing the perfect shots to set up that ko and everything was thrown with seriously bad intentions and of course with a little bit of help of mark goddard he was able to get out out of there catching him with the left hook knocking his ass out up against the fence one of the best moments of imposing one's will. Again, you need to be aggressive when you're down three rounds to one in a championship fight. And even though he was down in that fight, it was always one of those situations where he was very close, right? All the striking exchanges were extremely close and Pereira was mostly winning every single one of the striking exchanges, but Adesanya was doing his thing. He was mixing in the arts. He was mixing in the takedowns. He had rocked Pereira at the end of the first. Adesanya did a really good job of just stealing those rounds. And Pereira, you know, he, he put an end to all that nonsense in the fifth. And because uh, people will say things like, you know, well, Izzy was kind of dominating the fight. Well, well, you know, what about the second? And what about the fifth? Right? Adesanya couldn't make it to the end of the fight. So one of the best moments of someone imposing their will. Again, determination, warrior spirit. Uh, warrior in Portuguese is Guerrero. And Alex Pereira absolutely showcased his Guerrero spirit. Justin Gagey versus Habib Nurmagomedov, round one. One of the craziest imposing of one's will I've ever seen. Habib went into this fight compromised. I believe he had a broken foot. I believe he was even dealing with mumps. Now this was his last fight. And the thing is, Gagey actually won this first round, but the way that Habib looked in this first round, it honestly seemed like morally he won the round. He won the fight. Gagey won this round based on points, but Gagey was landing all of his shots on Habib's terms, meaning on the back foot when he's not in perfect balance to land the best shot possible. But Gagey was putting everything into his strikes and he was landing big clobbering hooks, big meaty hooks on Habib Nurmagomedov. He was mincing up the legs of Habib. It was so bad that Habib was stumbling over himself at times. And Gagey, you know, he's fast. He has that college wrestling background. He's definitely a little bit of an overrated wrestler, but you know, early on in a fight, he's not so easy to take down. Habib was working really hard to get the takedown because that's always what he wants, but he had to go through the fire. And his game plan was very clear from the get-go. Break this dude, demoralize this guy, put a certain amount of pressure on him to where he's totally uncomfortable by the end of the first round. And you can literally see through Habib walking him down, getting in his face, eating Justin Gagey's hardest punches, even though he's a little bit off balance on the back foot, uncomfortable while landing them. Again, Gagey's the guy that's grunting while throwing everything. So you got Gagey doing his Gagey grunts. He's fighting like Rufus. It looks like he's fighting for his life. And Habib's bobbing and weaving and bobbing and weaving. And Habib has this big block head and he's got a granite chin and he's beckoning Gagey on and, and, and shaking his head at him after everything that Gagey lands. He's throwing flying knees at him. He's literally running in his face. He's walking him down with his hands down. You know, just a terrifying thing to see. And you can see before your eyes, from the first moment of that round to the very last, Gagey breaks. Like you could see him gassing out, like in front of your eyes. Um, you could see his body language change. You could see his facial expression change. I mean, he looks like a completely different person after the five minutes, even though he won that round. And then, of course, Habib takes him down at the end of the round, twists Justin Gagey into a pretzel. I mean, hey, you can't say that Gagey's necessarily known for his jujitsu. Uh, Habib absolutely had his way with him in the second round, submitted him. But that first round, I mean, that sort of pressure, I mean, that's like a terrifying pressure. And if you just watch that first round, you'll see what I'm talking about. The unrelenting tenacity of Habib, you know, just taking the fight to Justin Gagey, and letting him know, listen, you're going to hit me, but it's going to be on my terms. It's going to be while you're on the back foot and you're uncomfortable the full time. 
that's what we saw. Great imposing of one's will. Next up, we have Charles Oliveira versus Dustin Poirier round one. Now, Charles Oliveira is one of the goats of imposing his will. He's one of the most aggressive fighters. But the reason why I'm going with the Poirier round, and he lost this round, is because he did such a good job of even while he was losing the majority of boxing exchanges, he got rocked, he got dropped in this round, was getting pieced up a little bit to the head. Even though he was losing in the boxing exchanges, he did what he could. And this is the thing when it comes to imposing your will. It doesn't always have to be easy. It doesn't always have to be smooth sailing. If you're getting lit up a little bit, try going to the body, right? It's the first round of a championship fight. Slow this motherfucker down. And that's exactly what Charles does. In the first round, you could see some of the most pitch perfect step in knees to the body you've ever witnessed. Some of the cleanest tie striking, Muay Thai striking, knees in the clinch you'll ever witness is with Charles Oliveira and Dustin Poirier. Just brutalized Dustin Poirier to the body. And I believe that that really aided him in gassing out Dustin for this fight so that he was easier to control and finish in that third round. Even easier to keep down on the ground in the second and just made him overall less effective. And it wasn't only the knees in the clinch, but it was also leg kicks. And Charles was just getting in his face and just basically running at Dustin Poirier, getting dropped, getting back up, high guard, high guard, gritty Muay Thai style, tough man style. Uh, so I have to include this in there as well. Again, you could say the Justin Gagey round one fight where Charles is moving forward, but there are moments where he's hanging out on his back and I'm looking for 100% imposing your will. And uh, this one beats that out by a little bit. And I also like it because even though there was adversity in the Gagey fight, I'm kind of kidding about you know him being on his back in the Gagey fight. Uh, when he got knocked down, like, I think that was a smart move from him. And, you know, imposing your will doesn't always have to be offensive. Like, you can be a counter striker on the back foot imposing your will as well. But I just like this one because, again, Oliveira, even though he got outboxed, he found ways to outdo Dustin Poirier. He found ways to land those nasty investment shots, right? To kind of sneak those ones in there, sneak the knees in there. When Dustin Poirier was focusing on upstairs, Charles Oliveira was in the basement going to the body, right? And I think that that's really good work for Oliveira. And uh, we saw how effective it was in the second and third round where Poirier kind of gassed out a little bit and it was smooth sailing from there on out. So I got to put round one against DP, the clinch work of Charles Oliveira moving forward, getting dropped, getting back up, moving forward. It's definitely got to be on this list. And speaking of being able to impose your will, even if you're counter-striking, even if you're on the back foot, let's talk about the ambush from Alexander Volkanovsky, the ambush heard around the world. Max Holloway, man, Volkanovsky put a Trojan horse on him. I mean, let's be honest. Let's talk about this. This was like a perfect example of, of getting caught off guard. Max Holloway in the rematch had knocked down Alexander Volkanovsky by countering his forward blitzes. And Volkanovsky knew this because, you know, Volkanovsky studies the tape. You could call him a bit of a technical maestro. So Volkanovsky, you know, him and the team, they got together. They basically set up this, um, you know, that you could call it a symbolic Trojan horse. They sent it to Max Holloway's camp. And Holloway thought shit was sweet. He was about to counter Volkanovsky again. But little did he know, Volkanovsky was waiting. And he had planted out the bait. Because Volkanovsky was throwing out bait out there to get countered. But it, he was he was throwing he was throwing patty cake shots at first. So Volkanovski would go in there, he'd throw a shot, but it wasn't really the shot that was meant to cause damage. You see, he was expecting Max Holloway to counter. And what Volk's plan was was to counter the counter. And that's what he did all night. Volk would throw first, he'd get Holloway to counter, and he would drift back and smash Holloway. Or change off on an angle, duck under Holloway's counter, and freaking catch him with a big gnarly overhand. And you could just hear Volkanovski in the first round. It was an ugly thing, because again, it's like Holloway thinks shit is sweet. He thinks he's about to have a good old-fashioned fight, good old-fashioned competitive fight. And now he's got Volkanovski screaming in his face. He's cut open in the first round. Within the first two exchanges, look up the fight, the trilogy this is. You can look up the fight. I believe the first head kick Max Holloway throws, it's in the first minute of the fight. Volkanovski already says something along the lines of, I'm saying everything. And he's talking to Max. He's saying, he's saying uh, I'm too fast for you. And, um, you know, Max is a bit of a trash talker in the cage, too. It was just an ugly, ugly beatdown in the early going of that fight. Granted, it did get a little bit more competitive towards the end of it, but Volk had hit his groove. And, man, it's just uh, 
really good ability of setting traps and having a purposeful, uh, intention-driven game plan. <laughs> Just an absolute technical masterpiece from Alexander Volkanovsky walking Max Holloway onto these uh, countering shots. So really well thought out approach. And again, just an example of you can be on the back foot and win a fight because Volkanovski was on the back foot basically the whole time, getting Max to close the distance, put him up against the cage and just countering effortlessly with combinations. And Holloway just couldn't figure out how to crack the code. And, you know, obviously he got 50 45 Volk became the pound for pound number one and uh, the rest is history. So an amazing moment of imposing one's will in a more sneaky manner. We also have Kamaru Usman's win over Tyron Woodley, one of the most dominant title wins in UFC history. He was the underdog going into this, and this is one of the hungriest performances I've ever seen. Not only did Kamaru Usman utilize his grappling to the fullest, but he also utilized the clinch game to the fullest. He didn't know how to take a back step, constant forward pressure, either putting Woodley up against the fence and beating the shit out of him in the clinch with knees to the body with uppercuts to the body or taking him down and smudging him into the canvas here's a photo of them on screen where Woodley's just gritting his teeth down and you could say what you want about a smudge like performance but you know sometimes it takes a lot of effort and you could see you know sometimes they'll try to trick the referee when they're just gritting their teeth down to make it look like they're working hard but Usman was working hard Usman was working hard he was just constantly chain wrestling 18 minutes of control time and it wasn't like the most inactive control time either. He was kind of smothering Woodley and suffocating him on the ground and, you know, doing his best to smudge him into the canvas with full force and full might. And 336 total strikes were landed as well. And there were moments where, you know, it looked like Woodley was on his way out. It looked like Kamaru Usman was about to get a TKO up against the fence. There were multiple moments like that in this fight. So you could say that Usman beat the dog shit out of Woodley. One of the best imposing of one's wills I've seen in a title fight and uh, a real good changing of the guard moment. We also have Max Holloway versus Calvin Cater. Another sort of depiction of someone breaking someone else who also thought shit was sweet. Now, remember, Holloway was coming off of a very close fight against Alexander Volkanovsky where he lost the last three rounds to Volk and lost a very close decision. And Calvin Cater was getting a lot of hype at the time. He had been coming off of a couple of KO wins. He had knocked out Jeremy Stevens on the first card back after the long layoff during that break in 2020. And he was getting hype as like the next best boxer in the featherweight division. And he was the younger guy and he was starting to say, or I actually think he was um, older than Max Holloway. So he was calling Holloway a freshman. He was like, I'm going to bully Holloway like he's a freshman and I'm a senior. And Holloway, of course, you know, kind of being doubted. A lot of fans were saying, surprisingly enough, they were saying, you know what? Calvin Gator's got some pretty good boxing. I think stylistically, this could be an issue for Max, right? This guy is going to be competitive with Max. And Holloway showed him what was up, all right? Holloway, I think, well, I mean, I don't think he broke the record for significant strikes landed and every single round landed more strikes than the last up until the fifth round i don't think he landed that many strikes in that round but he landed like 130 strikes 140 strikes in one of the middle rounds it was just marching forward the whole time landing the kitchen sink kicks to the body kicks to the head spinning back kicks pacing up calvin cater with boxing combinations elbows hurting him with elbows you know, ripping him up with um, knees in the clinch, like everything you could possibly imagine Holloway was hitting Calvin Cater with. It was like he had aimbot in this fight and he was pissed off. He was angry. Max Holloway had a chip on his shoulder because in the fifth round, he started to let everyone know that he was the best boxer in the UFC, which again was kind of trashing on Calvin Cater for saying he was the best boxer in the UFC. So again, this has to be one of the best moments of someone imposing their will and just taking the fight to their opponent, not backing up, bringing them into their game. You know, Calvin Cater wanted a nice little friendly back and forth on the feet, nice little one-two back and forth on the feet. And Max Holloway said, no, we're not doing this. I'm disrupting everything that you're doing. We're not just going tit for tat upstairs. 
I'm going to the body. Here's a jab to the body. And here's a kick to the legs. And here's a teep to the body. And here's an elbow upstairs. Like, you just didn't know what was coming, right? Just a very confusing sort of rhythm that Max Holloway had in this fight. And um, again, just brought a high-level striker into his sort of world and did what he wanted to do. So you got to put Holloway in the mix. Last but not least, we have the final volley, the final charge from the Korean zombie, him getting knocked out by Max Holloway in the third round of their fight last summer. And this was TKZ's retirement fight, so it couldn't have been more fitting. This was a classic, the Korean zombie zombie charge, but probably the most zombie-like charge I've ever seen with absolutely no care in the world for his health with no care in the world for his safety, and um, just went out there with the mentality of, I know Max Holloway's gonna be tough to beat. Because at this point, he knew he was probably screwed. He was getting outstruck. He was getting out grappled. It was getting ugly for TKZ. He was losing this fight. Third round, he goes out there. He says, fuck this. I'm, I'm, I'm putting the gloves down. I'm taking the gloves off. I don't care about not getting hit. I'm knocking Max Holloway out, or I'm getting KO'd stiff. All right, like he freaking runs at Max Holloway. Again, no defense. This is the, the perfect example of what what is defense? He doesn't even know what it is in this in this uh, this charge, as I like to call it, a, a final charge. And TKZ goes out there and just slugs at the fences, chin on a silver platter. I mean, I could have knocked the guy out with him fighting like that. He probably would have knocked me out because, you know, TKZ zombie charge. He'd still be faster and more technical than me. But I'm just saying... He's more open than I've, ever, than I've ever seen a fighter. Like, straight up, this was the most easily hit fighter you've ever seen in your entire life. Forgot about defense. Just literally throwing haymakers like Francis Ngannou when he fought Jarzino Rosenstrike. I mean, it was ugly. Really ugly. But it was commendable. It was hilarious. I was laughing my ass off while seeing it. And, um, yeah, man. I mean, like, if, if you're not Max Holloway with a really good ability to counter... If you're not an elite level fighter, TKZ is literally bulldozing you, right? Absolutely bulldozing you in this situation. And you got to respect it because, man, he went out on his shield. But this was one of the funniest moments I've ever seen in the cage fight. Uh, literally the epitome of no defense. And he just got knocked out cold. And I'll show you my reaction to it live to end off the video. But this is a perfect example of imposing one's will. Saying, you know what? Fuck this. We're not playing his game. I'm going to knock him out. Oh, TKZ lets his hand, hands go. TKZ is just slugging at this point. He's going to lose a slugging battle with Max every time. He's going for the TKO on Max. He's straight up running at Max Holloway. Holloway's going to... Oh! No! Woo! Holloway gets it done. Let's go. That's What is he doing? He just got slumped out. <laughs> what are you doing trying to go at Max Holloway like that? He was fighting all right. He, you're trying to go out there and slug with the granite chin? Oh my gosh. Live by the sword, die by the sword. Hey, you know what? It was just about to get a hundred times worse if he didn't go out like that. Like, he was not about to get a little twister on Max. Holy shit. Holloway just knocked him out badly. That's crazy to see Holloway get a KO like that as well. <laughs> How does he go out like that? That's something straight out of a comic book. TKZ actually running at him like old school zombie. What, what was his coach? What were his coaches telling him? I honestly think he, he, he kind of felt in that moment. Listen, this is my only chance. I'm going to say fuck it and just go for it. I've never seen a fighter straight up try to impose the will that hard.